So we will start the afternoon session now. So, thanks. Thank you. So this lecture will be uh, about um, some work with uh, Arguin and Radzivil. I want to explain more about how we can prove some results on Zeta in the context of, uh, in the context of uh, branching, as I mentioned um, earlier this morning. And uh, in particular, I want to emphasize what are the difficulties here and what kind of number theory we will need. That was emphasized in a, in a question before. So um, remember that this um, FHK conjecture for future of Harry and Kidding states that uh, if you have tau uniform on the OT, you expect the local maximum with an interval of side order one for zeta to be of order of t normalized by the double log t for three quarter. And there is some randomness. And uh, mt converges in distribution as t goes to infinity to some random variable m, which satisfies the uh, universal, um, supposedly universal property that m being greater than y has a probability of order to a constant y exponential minus 2y. Okay, so this is one conjecture from a whole net of conjectures involving also random matrices, measure of high points, and so on. But this is maybe one of the simplest ones and uh, cleanest ones to this case. The theorem that I want to explain will just be about the upper bound. So I will explain that uh, there exists a constant that for any y and t, the, uh, this probability this maximum uh, will be greater than uh, what it is expected to be and a tail exponential y. bound on the tail. This is, I will focus on this for this lecture. There is a matching lower bound and there is also a tail on the left of the limiting distribution instead of the right, uh, but I will not mention this, uh, which are somehow more technical and uh, maybe not as enlightening in terms of method. So um, let me try to explain first a really a toy model to explain the emergence of this factor, y exponential minus 2y, uh, that will be the branching random walk. So um, the context is as follows. You just look at a tree, starting here with the root. I will take a binary tree. Um, which is somehow the simplest non-trivial example. And for any vertices B and W, um, which are neighbors, I will assign a random variable, call them X. That's for V and W neighbors, uh, which are IID Gaussian with some variance sigma square. And from these variables, we can assign the results of the branching random walk on the leaves of the tree, which is, um, if I defined Vn, which are the ver vertices on the nth generation,
uh, Sn uh, of V or any V in Vn. Take the sum of x uh, vi vi plus one. Where my uh, sequence here is just a path from the root to the end. Which is non backtracking. Non -back tracking. So, for example, um, if I consider this V here, that's my path, and I'm collecting some Gaussians along the way, and that's what I call Sn of V. And the question is, uh, what is the size of S, the maximum of Sn of V? So um, imagine you, you define Mn to be the following um, um, number, which is easy to, to guess about the maximum. It's a sigma times a constant times n minus 3 half. Then the fact is, and this can be traced by to Bramson, as I mentioned, that we will just illustrate his method here, that the, the maximum of the Sn um, is um, greater than uh, Mn plus y. So what I'm going to uh, explain is that this is uh, more than a, a constant y initial minus. Uh, so exactly the same form as what I stated for for Fyodor Harry Kitten. Okay. Is is there something unclear here? It just that. It just that. Uh, this is a big C, in fact, let's call it C tilde. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, uh, what is Bramson's method here? So, as we mentioned before, we want to put a barrier in some way. So, the, the way you think about it is that you imagine that you have a large number of steps, so these uh, random walks actually look like just these boring motions. And here I get one uh, such SN of V after n steps. And there is a branching, which takes me to some SN of V prime, eventually. But we are going to condition all of them to be under some linear barrier, which is basically this mn, uh, giving the slope. And uh, we want to implement this. So how can we really implement that idea in calculation, okay, and see how it goes. So um, we just say that this is um, essentially uh, for some barrier call it f of k greater than y, such that which is typical and typical typical means here that uh, with large probability none of these uh, random motions or random walks are going to hit the barrier. So in practice what we really take is not quite linear, that would be too cost uh, unlikely, we need something a little bit concave, like a log from here, and then it becomes typical. Like they will typically not hit that barrier. But let's call it F just for now. Um, then it's very simple. We, you, you just do some kind of union bound, but in a, in a um, somehow sharp way. So first you, you say that um, it's only smaller than the probability 
that you are going to hit the barrier. So there exists a um, K and a V. That um, SK of V is uh, greater than K over N and N plus this barrier. Okay, we are going to prove more. That we are going to prove we are no, never going to hit. So, in particular, the maximum at the end is where we want it to be. And now you make a union bound depending on the first moment uh, where this may happen, hitting the barrier. Um, so we need some space here, but what you obtain is that you have this sum for all these times. At each time I have two, two to the k points, and I want all of these points to be uh, below the barrier before that time, and then at that time it hits. So more precisely, uh, what you obtain is a probability, if you call, um, if you call this number uk. Okay, so the sum of the probabilities that say sk plus one um, also in sum over a and b are equal to zero. So this is in um, uk uh, plus a plus one. So it's larger than you expect. But sk itself re is uh, below the barrier, minus db plus one say. Times the probability that you will actually remain below knowing that you end up here. is as follows. Maybe I should get rid of the previous one. You are, and you have just one path, and you consider the bad case where it may actually grow more than you expect. It calls the first time it happens k, and you condition on the value here and the value here, essentially, these are this a and b. And you look at the probability that you stay below here, and then you are there, okay? And you do a union bound over how many such paths you have up to time k. And then you believe me that it's a calculation, and you will get some c also minus uh, this uh, c over sigma one. So let me comment a little bit of the, on this calculation that I'm uh, not highlighting here. So this is. Just a Gaussian calculation, right? You, uh, well, the first time is just a Gaussian calculation, the probability to be somewhere for a Gaussian vector. The second one is a bit more tricky, is knowing you, uh, you are somewhere, um, what is the probability that you have never hit the barrier before? So as I told you, by, for a linear barrier, for barrier motion, this is like the product of the endpoints to the barrier divided by t. It happens to be also true for random walk in a wide vari variety of contexts. And I'm not going through that, but the point is you gain a factor one over t thanks to that. Because you gain a factor one over t, it eventually translates into a difference at the logarithmic level be between the one quarter and the three quarter. Okay. So that's ba basically how it goes. And this is, this is just an exercise really. But you need to use this value theorem that probability to stay below somewhere is in one over t. 
Okay, so at that stage, it looks very simple. And let's talk about zeta. and branching. Um, so why do we believe something like this may, may happen? So let me remind you um, that zeta, if you take the error product that you mix correct and you take the log and you, and you try to expand it, it could be that a good approximation is given by the following random walk. So for any h, let's say in between lines one and one, you define SK of H to be uh, the sum for log P up to exponential K of three parts P Okay, just look at this, at this uh, random walk in the sense that um, the randomness comes from tau. This creates in somehow independent phases here. And I took two terms. At the first order, you only have the square root p on the critical line, supposedly. But I, I also put this one because, strictly speaking, this one is not uniformly bounded. The sum of 1 over p diverges, so you have to include it to make everything work. But in practice, you can just think about this one. Um, for, for today. So there, is a, there are reasons to believe that this may be a good approximation for zeta on the critical axis in some sense, okay, for when exponential k is large enough. And why do, we, why do I take um, this exponential k? Well, you can write this as a sum of the yl of h, l up to k. That's my definition of yl, the increments. And this scaling is a relevant scaling so that the YLs have, all have the same variance. So the expectation of uh, YL square is of order one. Uh, actually, it's uh, like one half here with my scaling. Why, why so? Because if you take the expectation of the square of this term, and you assume that these are really independent, which has to be justified, then you get the sum of one over p. So this is the Mertens sum of the inverse of primes. We know that it diverges like a double log of x up to level x. So that's why you need a double log in the primes to actually have this scale. Okay? And once we write this, we, we have a branching picture. Just like I wrote this morning for for uh, random matrices. So this is going to be my log log t. I will decide to stop my walk there. I will explain why. Because it basically it's about taking primes up to capital T. I only take primes up to capital T because once they are below beyond capital T, this h um, uh, fluctuation scale goes below one over capital, one over log t, but we know that the zeros around high t have typical gap one over log t. So they dictate what is a good scale. The, the gaps between zeros dictate what is a good scale to stop here. Okay, so we, we do that. So, and um, essentially it will look like a random walk. This is my SK of H1. Say I stop by n, and I have another one, as n of h2, and the places, the place where they will split is given by the log of h1 minus h2, essentially, in terms of scale. And again, it's not so hard to see because you want p times the difference 
to be uh, so uh, yeah so so that's p times the difference of the h's which is order one or or diverging which dictates everything with a log p sorry so that's why you get the Um, are there any questions about this picture? Now, we want to justify that this is a good approximation for zeta itself. <laughs> so for this, let me mention the, the famous Selda central limit theorem. you mentioned this morning. So remember that basically it's, it states that the log of zeta when average on the critical line um, grows like a Gaussian with variance of, of order about double log t. And uh, if you want to catch the maximum of this random walk, basically you will, because you expect it to be linear, the square root of this double log is far from enough. You want to get to a scale which is double log. So you would like to justify the Gaussianity far in the tail in the central limit theorem. Unfortunately, this is only known up to um, log t, um, double log t, not to the, to the one, but to something like this. Actually, the best is uh, one times f one over ten, something of this order. So, getting values of log of zeta which are order of order double log t is not directly accessible by the methods uh, that were developed just for the cell back central limit theorem. So we have to use something specific about being on high points. Um, let me say just a few words about how cell back proved this. So the proof was in two steps. One is quite elementary, the second one is hard. So he proved this in uh, 19, for this six, that's quite old. Uh, there was a first paper under the many hypothesis in 44. Uh, so first, he finds that the log of zeta can be well approximated by a sum in the L2 sense. So you take the average of zeta in the L2 sense, but remove the first terms in the Taylor expansion that you expect. Then it's actually correct that uh, you have something which is bounded uniformly in capital T. And because there is a normalization, the, the, the bound goes away. And that allows you to reduce your proof of central limit theorem only to that term. Okay. The way he proves this is by developing a some kind of explicit formula for, for writing the log of zeta as the sum over primes plus some residue over zeros, which is under control. Um, and after this, you want to, what you really want is to justify that this behaves like Gaussian in the sense that this P to the IS, they become uniform independent on the circle. So you sum a lot of uniform independence um, with some prefactors. And if you be, and then the central limit theorem would, uh, would apply. And in fact, the variance would be the sum of one over P up to T to the epsilon that scales like a double log. Okay. And for this, well, uh, so it's a moment method. to justify that uh, these are independent. So 
you take the expectation of uh, product of p to the, um, let's say, i tau, and the product of p to the minus i tau to some coefficient beta p, alpha p, let's say p up to some, some level. You can just calculate these moments. And because the primes are the primes are linearly independent over Q, and that helps, you have some trivial bounds, which will tell you that, okay, not too large, this is behaving like the moments of uniforms. Circle. Okay. And, but you, for this, you need k not to grow too much. But that's enough uh, in that regime, actually, that works. You can, you can make that work. Um, now, for, for us, we, we have a big issue here that I want to, to emphasize, which is that the moments we need are far beyond this kind of, of regime. Precisely, if you um, if you use moments, okay. What we obtain, and it's actually a technology which is a hundred years old and uh, has not been improved ever since, and it's not enough here. The expectation of SK. Remember, SK is my random walk up to 10K um, to some power 2Q, say. What do we expect? We, we hope that we can prove that SK behaves like a Gaussian with variance K over 2, because it's the sum of uh, independent increments approximately Gaussian uh, with variance, let's say, one half here. So we wish we could, we could prove this, and, but there is an error term which behaves in the following way. There is always a 1 over t, and then it's exponential. Oh, 2q is exponential. So let me explain a bit of this error term. If you go back to this kind of picture, the way you calculate this is really by just writing as, as, as an integral of uh, an oscillation of exponential. But that's integrable. We can just find a formula for this. But there is a denominator which will be the sum of alpha p log p minus sum of beta p log p. But the sum of uh, this is never zero when the p's are different because the primes are the primes. And there is a trivial lower bound because the primes are integers. And uh, this trivial lower bound, you use this kind of te technology, basically you will get this term. Now that, that limits us a lot because for the maximum, of SK of H um, over maximum over H, what do we need? If you want to um, we expect SK will be of order K. There is this linear barrier which grows, right? And we expect the maximum will be like uh, N minus three quarter of log N, but at first order it's N. So we want to be able to quantify the probability to be in that range. But if you want to quantify that SK is of order K, in the moments you need Q of order K. If you want to go far in the tail, you want high, higher moments. So 
OK. And then we want to do it by the, by the end. Um, so, so this limits us. K actually is smaller than n. Remember that n is double log t minus a large constant log n. Because otherwise, this term will not be negligible. This term will not be negligible compared to this. It's a calculation. So there is no way we will just justify Gaussianity directly and so on. Okay, are there any questions so far? Okay, so let me explain um, the multiscale analysis to overcome this kind of problem. So here's how it works. We will work on iterated logarithmic scales. So we define nL to be uh, n minus the L slug of, um, of n. And uh, the way it will work is that we will be able to understand the fact that our random walk to achieve a high point have to remain in some corridor, actually, not just an upper bound. So let's say we want to achieve, uh, this is uh, n minus 3 quarter of log n plus some y. And we want to prove it's unlikely to get there. Um, what we really expect for trajectories, which eventually may get not too far from that, so this is just my linear growth that I expect. We expect them, as, as we mentioned, to be under this barrier. But we also, um, it would be useful for us to also impose that they will be above another one. And it's actually what happens. Uh, also, basically, all steps have to point uh, in the same direction on average to really get to a high point. So we are going to also define a lower barrier. So this one, let's call it uh, L of uh, K. So what is u of k? Um, in practice, we are going to take essentially u of k to be just y, the, the log of uh, and for l of k, we are going to um, yeah. So this is l of k. Okay, this is this is my linear barrier. This is k over n uh, and n. K over n plus n plus uh, n n plus u of k. Okay, my u of k. I think about it as uh, something which is essentially flat, but a bit curvy. And this one is uh, uh, k over n and n uh, plus l of k. And my l of k uh, is going to be um, something like. Uh, y minus a small constant, the minimum of um, k. And something, that, but don't, don't worry too much about this y. Actually, let, let's put it in minus y to make it easier. OK, and what we are going to prove is that any point which uh, in trajectory which unlikely may pop up here would have to stay in this corridor, and we will prove it by induction uh, that it, it just has to stay there. So more precisely,
define by induction, um, let's call it BL, the set of H, such that um, SK of H is smaller than this upper, um, upper barrier. up to NL. And CL, the set of H, so that uh, SKOH greater than K over N times N. Okay. And the key lemma is as follows. If I define H of Y, the set of uh, H, um, let's say minus one one, intersected with uh, the of T. So this is a set of H. I, I'm, I also discretize a little bit. This is my critical strip. In that window around tau of size one, which is here, I decide to uh, only consider not the continuum of H, but the discretization uh, about log T of them. Uh, because it's enough. It happens that there is a cheap argument to justify it's enough to look at the maximum on this point because it's, that's the scale of uh, spacings between the zeros there. So uh, it's, it's a reasonable assumption. So, uh, so, so the zero spacing is one of the log T. Okay, and the lemma is as follows. So the probability that you will find a high point which in, is in uh, the, the good sets B, L, and C, L is smaller than a universal constant, y central minus 2y, over iterated log of n, plus a priority at the further step. What, what does this um, tell us? We really want to be able to, to, to reach a high point and quantify things by saying that if it happens anyways, little by little, we know uh, some information about the trajectory, it has to be there. So this tells us that, uh, for example, imagine uh, L is a very small number, like one. So basically there is no constraint, it's just about the barrier at the start. So the probability to get a high point is essentially the same as the probability is upper bounded by the probability to get a high point and being at a, an extended barrier. It's the same up to this number. But when you sum over L, this is really the e Lth iterate of N, logarithmic iterate of N. So that's clearly summable in L if you go up to order one for this iterated log. So you obtain that it's smaller than the y exponential minus 2y plus the priority to stay in this area for the whole trajectory. Okay, so we know that if we want to get a high point anyways, the trajectory will be there, uh, almost up to the end. And then we want to bound the probability to make a big jump to get high at the end. And I want to explain how we do these kinds of things, what kind of moments we we are using because we are in a very high K regime, what kind of, what would be a substitute to the moment method that I, I mentioned is, uh, is not good enough here. Ten minutes more, maybe. Um, so let's go. So the 
the proof of this and the, the proof of the last step um, will rely on, a, on these twisted moments. What are they? It's also related to modifiers. So basically, uh, modifiers are technique introduced by Selberg in his first proof that the propor proportion of the zeta zeros were on the critical line. And it's basically about calculating moments of zeta after multiplying by a well-chosen Dirichlet polynomial. So before I get into the technical details, basically what, um, what this will say is, is uh, these are uh, statements of the following type. Zeta of one half plus i tau plus h. And we will be able to go to the fourth power, say. Uh, multiply by a um, product of two uh, Dirichlet polynomials. Q1 at uh, one and a half plus i tau plus h. So let's forget the h, sorry, i tau. Square. Um, okay, what? Um, okay. Q2. Square. I will get a bound on this where Q1, Q1 will be an approximation for the inverse of zeta, the sum of mu n over n to the s, over n, but only for n in some set A where A basically takes into account the all primes up to some level. It's more complicated in that direction. Up to some level K. Okay, I assume that for Q1 and for Q2, I assume that it's also supported essentially on N in A. Okay. So what happens is you have zeta, and this is essentially the inverse of zeta taking only to account the primes up to some level. So what, uh, Oh, and I need the power four here, sorry about it. Four. So what remains from here is only the primes above this k, and this one is about the primes below this k, so that splits. So the twisted moments um, are statements of this type. Uh, why is this good for us? I will explain in a, in a little bit, but let me give a precise statement about what we prove of this type, which is enough for our approach. Uh, is is uh, the heuristics every somehow clear that the primes, if we believe they decouple, there is something of this type? So the set A, um, will be of this type. So let me give a, a precise definition. If you have a polynomial, uh, Dirichlet polynomial, sum of gamma of n over n to the s, we say that it is k well factorab factorable written as follows. 
models is the product is in and n minus one on L times Q uh, one by K on S. So it can be written as a this type where Q lambda is supported in the following set. If P divides N then P uh, the double log p has to be in n lambda minus one and lambda, and the number of um, prime factors dividing n is of order n lambda minus n lambda to some large power, maybe ten. Okay, let me explain that a little bit. So basically, these are Dirichlet polynomials. They have this form. It's a product of the lambda of, of uh, terms of type Q lambda. So we start with k factorable. For a given k, there is a unique L such that this is here. So L is fixed depending on k. For well, given k, there is a unique L such that this is true. And then I take the product over the lambda smaller than this L, and this one I have not defined yet. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, yeah, no, so, so uh, I meant L here. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so, um, so this is really just saying that it's supported on the on the numbers uh, factorable as from primes in this interval. And this is saying that the number of primes is not too big. So this is, a, again, a typo, lambda minus one. Um, and uh, if you remember the other sketch theorem, the other sketch theorem tells you that if you pick a random number up to some level x, typically it will have a number of prime factors double log x. And the fluctuations will be in the square root of double log x. But it has a kind of double log x uh, number of primes. And the typical number of primes that you may expect in this interval would be this without this power. Okay. But we, we, we do add this constraint uh, to avoid when we will take moments large multiplicities which make moments blow up. We have to look at uh, Dirichlet sums supported on numbers without large multiplicity to avoid big moments. That's, that's one thing. So that's my Q lambda and my Q L K is the same type except that my P, uh, it's a log two P now is in uh, N L and K and uh, omega of N. So we, we have, this is what I define as a well factorable uh, Dirichlet polynomial. Basically what it means is there is no large multiplicity. And uh, another definition um, Find a um, um, okay. Let's call it um, M for Mobius, M uh, of S, uh, and K of S. It's the same as Q, uh, but you just take gamma 
over the Mobus function. So it's a specific case, it's one specific case. So you basically, mk is going to be a product of terms with the Mobus function, so it will be an approximation for the inverse of zeta. And what, what happens is that this estimate is correct when you take q1 of type type mk, you can pick any mk, this one, if this one is of type mk, and this one is of type qk, then uh, the statements of this nature are true. And it's because we take moments, but they don't really blow up thanks to our multiplicity bounds, which are still typical. Um, now, why is this useful? I want to explain a little bit. Zeta multiplied by mk, it's about what happens at the end. Because I remove everything about the primes. This is like the last increments beyond k. And this is what happens before. So these moments allow you to encode things of the following, events of the following type. I am in the corridor up to nl, and I make a big jump from sl to zeta on the last increment. And this bound gives, allows you to bound these kinds of events. So there is a lot of work to encode being in the corridor by a Dirichlet polynomial. And to um, just um, uh, make the full, um, the full proof um, go through. The, um, just to conclude, so these kinds of twisted moments and modifiers have a long history, going back to Selbach, as I said, it has been worked by um, Ivaniak, Fernander, and uh, Bettin, Bui, Radzivil, and others, uh, very recently in around 2011. Uh, and this version we had to cook uh, for our purpose with multiplicity bounds, for example. And uh, in terms of general multiscale technique, uh, this applies essentially any time you will have a branching structure where the finer scales are poorly understood. It's hard to control them. It's hard to take large moments, for example. I think this iterative scheme when, where you add a lower barrier is a good way to proceed in such settings. For example, uh, probably there is a proof for, for at least up to tightness uh, to, for random matrices uh, using this kind of recursive scheme. Um, thank you very much. Questions? Yes? I wanted to ask about the universal scale in the process of applying the supply sequence. Do you know if you would do anything with the supply sequence factor also from the Balot theorem? Yes. Uh, the, remember that in the Balot theorem, I told you uh, the priority to remain below is a product of the distances at the extremities to the barrier times the length of, uh, of the interval. Um, if you want to be, be, be beyond this, uh, what I call mn plus y, well, one of these barriers, one of these distances will be y. Okay. Other questions? Uh, so what, why, is the, why is the fourth moment so fundamental? So if we want to carry our analysis only with the second moment, that would not be enough in terms of uh, Gaussian tells that you observe thanks to the high moments. We need two plus epsilon. But this is analytic number theory. Two plus epsilon has to be four. And um, the, we are, as I stated this morning, I think uh, it's, a, it's a really uh, lucky situation that this fourth moment is actually accessible. But six is definitely not. Other questions? All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you.